Hey, pastors and church leaders, I wanted to take a minute and talk with you specifically about how Nothing is Wasted can partner with you and your church in helping people navigate the valleys of pain and trauma. It doesn't take long for those in ministry to realize the incredible needs that stem from the difficulties people have walked through in their lives. In fact, it can become quite overwhelming to even begin to know how on a large scale to make your church a place where hurting people can not only find a place to belong, but also the healing they need. This is the heart behind the Nothing is Wasted Pain to Purpose course. And and we know from pastors and church leaders just like you that this course is bringing incredible hope and healing to those within churches across the country. Listen to Pastor Kenneth Wagner of United Church in Delaware share what a difference Pain to Purpose is making in his church's DNA. As a lead pastor, it has been one of the most rewarding things for me to watch people walk through Pain to Purpose and to be able to see that that not only do we have a resource for them, but we've got uh, a place, an atmosphere, a community of, where people can come to and just work through their stuff. So if you're ready to equip your congregation with the tools it needs to heal and see the life-changing transformation from pain to purpose, not only for their own personal benefit, but so that they can better serve the church, the community, and beyond, let us help. To learn more, go to nothingiswasted.com slash churches. Again, that's nothingiswasted.com slash churches and join churches all over the country that are bringing healing in a practical, biblical, trauma-informed way to those within their walls. Nothingiswasted.com slash churches. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Nothing Is Wasted podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Aubrey Sampson, and I'm joined by... Eric Shoemaker. Eric Shoemaker, not Schumacher, but spelled Schumacher. Yes. Yeah, it's a lifelong struggle. I'm, I'm sure it is. It's, I, <laughs> it's not quite the same, but I feel like my whole life is Aubrey, not Audrey. Aubrey with a B. Yeah. So you're probably like Shoemaker spelled Schumacher. Or it's not yep. It's like Shoemaker, but yeah. And then I feel guilty if I'm like <laughs> calling someplace for customer service and I just say Schumacher because... Why not? I, I'm like a bet, I betrayed my whole family. But sometimes it's easier, right? Just to like, fine. I'm Schumacher. I don't. I don't have. To, yeah. I don't have time or energy for this. I, well, anyway, Eric Shoemaker, we're so glad that you are with us. Eric's been uh, joining. If you've missed any of our episodes, he's been here for the past few episodes as a co-host. He'll be with us a few more. But he's officially joining the team now. So you're going to hear right. Eric do some interviews and. Uh, hear Eric and Davey do this kind of thing, hear me and Eric do this kind of thing. So this is fun. It's always been our goal and nothing is wasted to empower more voices and bring on more voices. And so uh, this is awesome. And we actually had a whole interview with Eric, was it a month ago, two months ago at this point? Maybe even more than that. Oh, yeah. It seems like a lifetime's passed Yeah, since but then, be sure to go know. catch up on Eric's episode. He talks a lot about um, uh, miscarriage, child loss from a father's perspective. So... Um, you'll you'll really, really enjoy hearing from him and getting to know him here at Nothing Is Wasted. So, Eric, again, glad that you're with us. Love being here. All right. So today is – I was telling you before we hit record, today's episode is with Tori Hope Peterson. She grew up in the foster mm. care system. She's a biracial child, you know, grew up as a biracial child in a confusing and sometimes volatile world. Like, her story is – Wild, I don't want to ruin it, but she was in many foster homes. All strikes against her, ultimately, and yet God stepped in in such a powerful way. Again, I don't want to spoil anything, but she's now on the other care, other side of the foster care system as an advocate. And I was telling you, this is what I was telling you before we hit record. I was interviewing her, and I was like, man, she's a Christian. Like, this mm. lady loves mm-hmm. Jesus. She's young. She's a powerhouse. She's a new book out called Fostered, One Woman's Powerful Story of Finding Faith and Family Through Foster Care. And she's young, too. I We were trying to remember. I think she's like 25 years old or something. Yeah. It's, yeah. I I was like, wow, I, I need to come to Jesus now. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Totally. Yes. Yes. That's probably how you'll feel, listener. You'll be like, oh, okay, she is so inspiring. Um, I think let's go ahead and hand it over to Tori because she has so much to say. I don't want our listeners to miss it, but we do want to invite you to be sure to like and follow us at Nothing Is Wasted Ministries on Instagram. And we also would love to invite you to go to Apple Podcasts, subscribe to the podcast, and then be sure and rate and review the podcast because that helps other people 
find all of these inspiring stories as they walk through their own painful valleys. So with that in mind... Let's unless, go. oh, unless on those reviews, if you thought this was a cooking <laughs> podcast and you're going to leave us a one star review because you're disappointed, don't do that. <laughs> don't leave us a one star review because you thought it was a cooking podcast. Eric, you have to tell the people what we're talking about now. We're talking about <laughs> ridiculous one star reviews on our books. Yes. Where people thought the book. So I wrote a little novella called My Last Name. It has the picture of an elderly lady's hands folded in her lap. And there's a one-star review on Amazon that you need to go read because <laughs> the person was so disappointed that the book wasn't about the Holocaust. They thought it was going to be about the Holocaust. I don't know why. And it has Eric nothing got to do a one-star with... review because of that. <laughs> yeah. I Hey, I, I disappointed said reviewer, so... You're gonna, it. you're gonna take yeah. that. And I was telling Eric, I have a friend, Catherine McNeil. She's actually been on the show before as well. That she does not write cookbooks, but she got a one star review because a reader was disappointed she didn't have a recipe in her book. So please go rate and review in a way that makes sense for the nothing is wasted. And this episode is a five star all the way through. This is absolutely. Uh, I mean, I want to give Tori six stars. Yeah, she deserves six stars. Tori Hope Peterson. Let's go ahead and take a listen to my conversation with her. Well, hey, Tori, welcome to the Nothing is Wasted podcast. So glad that you're here today. Aubrey, thank you so much for having me. Um, Okay, Tori, so I know a little bit about your story, but I don't know that all of our listeners do, although some may know. So I... We value story here at Nothing is Wasted, and so I want you to take as much time as you want to, dive in wherever you want to, but I would just love to hear your story and where God has you now. I know that's a big kind of open-ended question, but um, I just want to give you the mic. Yeah, thanks for asking. I love stories too. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, so there's so much power in storytelling and um, I just believe that telling stories is the way that I can bring glory to my Heavenly Father, who has given mm. me so, so much. So, I was born to a single mom. Um, I was conceived out of abuse, but my mom, mm. I'm so grateful for her. She made the very hard decision to choose life for me. And wow. because of that, um, I've gotten to live a very unusual, uh, but good and redeemed life. My mom, growing up, she struggled with mental illness, um, struggled with finances, and so she was selling drugs. I went into the foster care system for the first time after a drug raid um, in our home. Mm. You know, the SWAT team just busted wow. through our front door. Caseworker came and swooped me up, and I entered my first foster home. But the foster system did... How old were you then? Sorry. I was like four, I think, you know, you oh, don't really so have like a concept little. of like age or time. Yeah. I think I was like three or four. Yeah. My mom says that I was in the system for about six months okay. um, during that time. So that's pretty short, actually. Um, my mom okay. worked her case plan and then I was reuni- reunited with my mom, which is one of the roles of the foster care system to reunite families. And um, I was really happy to be back with my mom. Loved my mom. Um, yeah, drugs around our house, and that isn't a good thing for kids. But to me, I I didn't know any different. Like, it wasn't unsafe yeah. to me. Then as yeah. I got yeah. older, the abuse in our home got significantly worse, and I didn't want to live in our home. Um, my mom's mm. mental illness got um, increasingly worse. And, um, just, she would go into people call it mania. Um, she'd have these fits Mm. of mania and, um, you know, she would crazy things like I was, there was this one time I was like 12 and my mom accused me of stealing her car. Um, and like, I didn't even know how to drive. Um, Mm. and you know, that would result in beatings and Mm. stuff that just hurt me. I had a sister at this point. That was nine and a half years younger than me. Wow. And um, I just, I think uh, maybe I was just tired of being hit. I don't know what was in me. But for the first time, I hit my mom back. And my mom called the cops on me. I went to a juvenile detention center, JDC, for 18 days. And then I had a court case. And at this court case, they were determining if I would be charged with domestic violence. 
I had what's called a guardian ad litem or a CASA, um, and that's someone that advocates for what's in the best interest of the child. So they take the child, talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, and there's just a lot of things that we hid in our home, lots of secrets. Mm. And so when the guardian ad litem was taking me to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, my mom was not happy with that. She would come to the outside of the door, start banging on it, screaming. We're like in the courthouse where police are, where the judge is. And so then my guardian lied him. She moved me to the next room and the next room. We went to like five rooms before we wow. found some quiet. Mm -hmm. And I told her, you know, she just said like, I promise you if things are happening in your home that you need to talk about that are bad, like you will not go back there. And I was wow. like, okay, maybe this is like my way out. Like maybe me and my sister are going to yeah. escape the abuse. So yeah, I told her everything that was happening. And I was like, I just remember opening the door and being like, okay, this is it. Like I'm stepping out of mm -hmm. the chaos of my home. And my mom was on the outside of the door. Whoa. My stomach just dropped. It was so scary because my mom always told oh. me, like, I brought you into this world. I'll take you out. If you tell anyone what's happening in our oh. home, everything's going to get worse. Because of that situation, uh, we ca we walked out and, like, my mom was like, you betrayed me. Like, because she heard everything. And she just said it, like, right in front of the guardian that lied on and in front of the cops and everything. Like, you betrayed me. Like, you traitor. Um, oh. And... Sorry then we actually didn't have the court case that day. Uh, we didn't have the hearing. The judge determined that I just go into the foster care system. And so okay. me and my sister went to the foster care system, our first foster home. And um, I thought, okay, this is our way out. Like we're gonna have family, things are gonna be normal. Um, but within just a few weeks, my sister was abused. I reported wow. it. She stayed yeah. in that home. I went to a group mm -hmm. home, and that started the journey of me and my sister continuing to be separated, me moving mm -hmm. throughout many more homes in the foster care system. I lived throughout 12 total. Um, wow, Tori. And then I chose to emancipate the day I turned 18. You know, there's kind of like this, I don't know, um, idea that youth are kicked out the day they turn 18, and that's not true anymore. Uh, that was true. I mean, it's been decades now. Um, yeah. But the government changed there. They knew that that it was pretty evident, like kids need support after they turn 18. Um, yeah. So there's extended foster care in some states till 21 and some states till 27 years old. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Wow. And so you can actually continue to receive a lot of the benefits. You get your housing. It, this wasn't all in place when I was in care. But now okay. um, when I was in care, it was just like you could possibly get your college paid for. Um, okay. I ended up going to. I should I shouldn't say that yet. It's not it's not part of the story yet. But um Okay, edit, edit, edit. edit, edit. No, no, no. <laughs> we can keep it in. Just we can just laugh about it. Okay, okay, we'll come back. It's to funny. It. <laughs> um but the there weren't a lot of things in place, but like kids don't now they don't get kicked out. They choose to leave because they usually okay. feel so burned by the system. The rules of the system mm. when you stay in it are absolutely ridiculous because you're an adult. But then your caseworkers mm. can say things like, well, if you want to keep receiving uh, the government stipend, you can't get a tattoo. Uh, or wow. um, you have wow. to give us, you know, all the reports of your working life and say you're self-employed, like I'm self-employed. Um, mm. And so there are just things like that, that um, youth just want out of the system. So I chose to sure. emancipate. I chose to emancipate because okay. I just felt so burned by the system. So yeah. like 20% of youth have experienced the foster care system. I was instantly homeless the day I turned 18. Bounced That's around right. um, just from people's houses in my community. Yeah. Thankfully, in my 12th foster home, I had a foster mom who was taking me to church. And um, this is when a lot of my story takes uh, quite a turn. I was going to church, um, had a lot of questions about God. I... Yeah just couldn't understand if God is so good, why did I experience so much hurt? And why yeah. did other people, other children, experience mm -hmm. more hurt than I had? Yeah. Um, why was I separated from my sister? 
that was something that I blamed myself for for a really long time because mm. I felt so much like I was trying to keep my sister safe. But if I just would have kept my mouth shut, then I would have actually stayed with my sister and I would have been mm. able to be in control and keep her wow. safe because she had to stay in the home. And so there, there were all these questions that I had wow, about God. Weird. And I just felt like I couldn't trust him. I felt like he didn't love me. I wanted to understand why didn't he give me a father that would have solved so many problems because if Mm. I would have had a father, then I would have maybe not went into the foster care system or I would have had someone who protected Mm. me from the abuse in my home. And as I kept going to church and just singing the songs and listening to the sermons, I I have always loved, um, there's always been a piece of me that loves learning. And so yeah. even when I was like, I'm not pursuing God, I did want to pursue truth. I wanted to pursue intellect. I wanted to pursue mm-hmm. knowledge. Mm-hmm. And in that, I came to understand that God was my father, that he was the father that I was wow. always looking for, that he had protected me and he had loved me. And he had prepared me like God did such a great job preparing me. And when I was able to look back, I could see that. And the question that I had about my suffering, of course, still remained. But again, when I learned more about the character of Jesus and who Jesus is and Mm -hmm. that, you know, he came to live a life on earth so that we could learn from his life so that we could live like him. I understood that he suffered the greatest suffering of all, but his suffering wasn't wasted. And so Mm. I found so much peace and joy in knowing that in Christ, my suffering was not going to be wasted, that it could be used for God's glory. And uh, that's when I just started walking with the Lord and being like, just use my suffering, use my life um, Mm. for whatever you want. And I, didn't do it well in the beginning. I don't even know if I do it well now. But um, I made a lot of mistakes early on in my faith walk, in my faith journey. Mm-hmm. And um, But God has just been, been so good to me. And I really was like, even through all the mistakes, like, this life is yours. And do what you want with wow. it. Um, through that, kind of like, do what you want with my life, Lord. I also had a prayer. I was running track. I had a track coach who came into my life, started mentoring me. And loving me and he was like Tori it was the summer after my junior year he was like Tori I think you can go into the state track meet and I think you can win it and I was like this old man's crazy no one had ever <laughs> said anything to me like that I heard mm. many things from my community that I was going to be a statistic that mm. um, there were all these stereotypes placed on me that I was gonna be like my mom that if I had kids they're gonna end up in foster care I was gonna be a young mom um yeah. all these but there's nothing wrong with being a young mom actually um right. I am a young mom but all the, like all those things were stereotyped under mm-hmm. something bad right and so I did fear that a lot and I thought when my track coach said that to me I was like this man's crazy but we're just gonna do what he says and literally what I thought was I'm gonna do what he says and if it doesn't turn out it's all his fault because it was his idea <laughs> And I literally thought, if I do him, yeah, and it was like, if I literally do everything he says, then it can't come back on me. So I literally did everything he said. I trained the way he told me to train. I ate the way he told me to eat. I slept the way he told me to sleep. Like everything. And that year, I became a four time state champion in track and field. Come on. That's awesome. (laughs) It was crazy. (laughs) It was like, seriously, these are like, and those are the moments where like, God's, it's just so clear God's hand was over my life because yeah, he used yeah. my stubbornness and my doubt literally for good. I was up against mm-hmm. the defending state champion. So there was the, the girl that won all the events that I won, won them the year before. Um, so it Come was, on. yeah, I, I beat the defending state champion. I was the 50th girl in the state of Ohio to um, win four state 
titles in one meet. Awesome. I was Come the on. first individual woman at my high school Woo. to be a state champion, and I was the first person of color at my high school to be a state champion. Tori, that is so <laughs> incredible. This Thank is the you. question I have. If you were going to blame him for failing, did you give this coach all the credit for doing it, or were you? did you see, like, oh, wait, this is – I did this. God it's, did this in me. It's so funny. I do say that like God did it. I do. I because yeah. the prayer that I had in the midst of like being like, Lord, I'm giving my life to you. I kind of yeah. like tried. To, I tried to make a deal with God. I was like praying with him, and I was like, Lord, <laughs> if you let me become a state champion, I promise I'll give you all the glory. And I know, like, I know now that we can't bargain with God like that. But I think He let me. I think He let immature yeah. Tori yeah. be like, yes. okay, because I think He was like. Because I, I still feel like at the center of my heart, like that's the promise. Like I promised mm. God something and why I do what I do is because 17 yeah. year old Tori 10 years ago promised that she would give God the glory. But I do try yeah. and give my track coach a credit. My track coach actually, <laughs> I love, <that>. I love <laughs> it. My track coach actually, um, what he should really get the credit for is he ended up welcoming me into his family and he ended up adopting me into his family come on uh, that same year <laughs> are you serious <laughs> yes yeah, so he's my dad he is who Aww. I came back to in college and who I did Christmases and holidays wow. with he is who wow. my children call grandpa come on come on so as you're like coming to know Jesus and you're praying these prayers God reminds you of course that he's your earthly father is like inviting you into that but then brings you this dad who's actually a safe man that you could trust and then all this favor I, it's I so love, wild because for it, so long wild, Tori. I I was like I was so hung up on God giving me a father like so hung up on it mm. and then when I was like okay God like I just surrender this to you you are my father you've always been my father the best father of all then mm. he gave me my track coach as my father figure and like as my dad like he is truly my father and it's so common in my life like it is a pattern in my life and i think if we if a lot of us look at our lives we would see this that when we let go of that thing that we are gripping onto god gives it to us above and beyond what we could even imagine but we have to let go of what we expected and what we wanted from him Yeah, and that letting go is such an act of faith, but I think you are so right. Like, that's sort of when the adventure begins, and you Mm -hmm. go, oh, Lord, you are so much better than I could have even imagined. But you're right, it takes takes a little bit to just go, okay, 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 Mm -hmm. I'm going to let go and trust. I also, there's something to me that's so remarkable about a God who, even though you were, like, bargaining with him and kind of doing the thing you're, like, quote, unquote, not supposed to do, Mm -hmm. like... He just met you with such grace and favor. And that to me is just like, that right there is the love of a good, good father, Mm -hmm. right? Who's like, I don't care how she asks. I see her heart. I'm going to show up in her. Like, there is something. Sometimes I think we get too stuck on like, oh, the right way to, I I don't know. So I love that God kind of blows the doors off of sometimes the boxes we put him in. Yes. And I do feel like that is the heart of my heavenly father, that Mm -hmm. he just meets me where I am. Uh, He meets all of us where we are. I always hear, you know, like in this Christian leadership realm of coaching and writing and speaking and whatever it is, like people always like, you have to meet God in the morning, like first thing in the morning. But there are people who are in their faith that just aren't going to do that. Just find that too intimidating. Yeah. The, also, that is a great privilege. Like when you Thank don't you. work, like it is a great Thank you. privilege. Not everyone has the time, the finances, the resources to meet God every morning. Uh, and so, and so, I don't want to interrupt you, but Tori, you're a mom. Like moms can't always do that in the morning. Are moms not allowed to have a spiritual life? Like this drives me crazy. Literally. Anyway, go ahead. And I know they're actually, and it's it's hard because it is biblical. Like there is literally scripture that says like, meet God in the morning, like receive your daily bread. But at the same time, we also have a heavenly father that meets us where we are, whether that's during our kids' nap time, whether that's during our lunch hour at work, whether that's in our car when our kids finally fall asleep. I do, I do devotions in my car so much when my kids fall asleep. Yeah. But like, 
God just meets us where we are. Like that is the heart yeah. of our father. And just mm. like whoever's listening to this, like God just wants to meet you wherever you want to meet so him. Good. He is like, yeah. he's like, you don't got to do it at the butt crack of dawn. Like he's just like <laughs> wherever you are right now, like meet him. And he will be so delighted to meet his son, mm. to meet his daughter. Mm, so good, Tori. Such a good word for all of us. Um, I want, I sort of want to skip ahead to where you are now and then go back and ask you some follow-up questions. So tell us, okay, so the Lord is meeting you. You win these, uh, this incredible title, four titles, um, and you see God's favor. You're adopting this family. Like, move us now. So you're, what, 17, 18 around then. Like, move us now to your 27. Like, what's that journey been like? Uh, it's been a journey of saying yes. I would say Mm. that's maybe been the most consistent pattern. Um, I started gaining speaking engagements when I was 16 or 17 um, from my church, from local nonprofits in my community. And because I said that prayer of God, I promise to give you the glory. I just always said yes. Um, He was just always like, yeah, um, I just didn't want to waste and I can't I can't waste what God has done like God will use it he doesn't I like I really believe that God doesn't need us um mm-hmm. but it is he will like it is such a privilege for him to use us and we get to say yes yeah. or no to that yeah. just like yeah you know yeah. Esther and Mordecai told her her uncle told her like if you do not do this. God will choose someone else. And so I think yeah. that I was like, I don't want God to choose someone else. I want God to choose me. I, <laughs> I want to be the one. Yeah. yeah. And I made this promise to him. Like I made this promise oh. to him and he has given me so much favor and he has been so good to me. And there are a bunch of people who are coming after me, a bunch of youth in foster care, kids coming from hard places, young women who have been trafficked or are going through abuse who mm. aren't going to have everything that I have, um, a community, yeah. a track coach, people who love them. And so, yeah. like, the least I can do is offer them the truth of the gospel that can save them, even when they don't have all of those things. Mm. So, um, okay. I just started saying yes, um, speaking at group homes. And it was, like, you know, once, twice a year, you know, from yeah. when I was, like, 17 and then throughout yeah. college. Um, and I would do, you know, if there was an opportunity for a community service project, I was usually the first person to hop on something like that. I remember my senior year, awesome. uh, my senior year of college, I didn't get good grades in college. I went to a very rigorous college. I was a 4.0 student in high school, then went to college. Um, and it was really hard for me. Went to a pretty rigorous college and okay. I was so blessed to get a really good education, but I did not get good grades. And um, mm-hmm. my senior year, there it was an Israel trip. I think they choose like 30 kids at our entire school to go. You have to apply to it. It's very competitive. I had the lowest GPA they'd ever admitted. And they told me that it was because they, yeah, they told me it was, I mean, it was because the favor of the Lord, but they told me, um, it was because of my community service. Um, whenever there was like, cause whenever there was an opportunity, I was just like, yes, Lord, like your glory, like let it shine. I'm going to do it. Um, and so I see those were the ways and, to me, that was just like, that was just a life I wanted to live. Uh, but I yeah. see now I look back and I'm like, oh, I see how you were preparing me now for r- running a nonprofit with programs, uh, my own nonprofit with programs, uh, wow. being a public speaker, writing a book. Um, yeah. I, and I started writing when I was living with my mom and, you know, she always said, you can not tell anyone. And if you tell anyone, things are going to get worse. So I would just journal. I would like l- journal. And then <laughs> one time I was living in a foster home and the foster mom told me that when she didn't know how I was feeling, she would go and read my journal <laughs> because I no wrote, way. yes, I know that's really not good, but I think it shows <laughs> that I wrote ev- like I wrote everything down. And so wow. sometimes people are like, what do I do in this life? Like, what is God calling me to look back and see what God was doing? Doing? What are the things that he gave you that got you through the hard time? And God gave me writing. God gave me speaking. God gave me running these programs and community service projects. And I was like, I was usually like the leader of them. I didn't. Wow. And I, I don't say that boastfully or like, I yeah, just look yeah. back and I'm like, oh God, like mm. you are doing all of that, preparing mm. me for what is now. So now, um, 
I am a public speaker full time. I equip and encourage churches to get involved in foster care, to get involved in their communities in the hard, um, dark places that usually yeah. we, we step back from as the church. Um, but mm -hmm. because we have the Holy Spirit that literally dwells within our very being, it mm -hmm. is possible for us to step into the darkest, the most broken of places and bring healing and wholeness Amen. to them. Um, so yeah. just encouraging the church to like, just because we're a part of a church, um, doesn't mean, you know, that we don't step into these places anymore. That's so good. Um, the call of Christianity yeah. is a call, not a club. So encouraging, mm -hmm. just encouraging, That's equipping good. the church to do just that. Um, and in a different ways, conferences and fundraisers, health nonprofits, yeah. uh, raise money yeah. who are serving kids who grew up like me or serving families who grew mm -hmm. up, who are taking care of kids like me. And then I just released um, a book, a memoir, Fostered, who releases a book, a memoir at the age of 26. I know I did. I love it. Um, <laughs> he wrote it when I was like 23. But uh, wow. that released just months ago. And God has been so faithful with that book. And I hope to write I do want to say books. the title of that book for our listeners is called Fostered, One Woman's Powerful Story of Finding Faith and Family Through Foster Care. So we'll be sure to have that in mm. our, our show notes as well. So, Thank okay, you. one of the other incredible things is you're a mom through all the avenues, right? Like foster, adoption, bio mom. Uh, you know, I, I don't want you to share private things about your kids, but can you talk us through that a little bit? Yes. Um, I birthed my first uh, biological son at 22 or 23. I don't know. It's all a blur. I think it was 22. <laughs> yeah, um, that's how I am with my kids. I don't know. I was yeah, some age. They I don't know. They but he's, he's four. <laughs> and um, oh, then nice. in between that, we had a young man that literally got dropped off at our doorstep. People knew our ministry. Of We just had let people in. We, mm -hmm. me and my husband, uh, we had this ministry for a little bit and like, we call it a ministry now. So I say that out loud so people can understand what we do. Uh, what we did when we started doing things in our home, letting people in, it was lit. It's literally just the lifestyle that we want to live. Yeah. Gotcha, um, but then gotcha. everyone else started calling it a ministry. So that's what I call it now. So people understand. Um, yeah, but yeah. my husband and I, we would, um, like go through McDonald's driveways and we would tell the employees, we'd be like, Hey, do you want to come over for dinner tonight? Or do you want to come over for dinner come next on. week? And we would give them our number and we would have like McDonald's employees <laughs> in our house. And people just knew that like we did these kind wow. of things of letting people in, hosp really valuing wow. hospitality, um, caring wow. about the orphan and the widow. And I think that's like mm. people knew from our social media platform. We shared it on there to encourage, mm -hmm. not to like exploit people, but to encourage other people yep. to get involved. And so yep. from there, um, someone messaged me, brought this young man, drove him two hours to our house. And um, he said, I'm not going to stay. He's, he didn't bring any of his stuff because he said, I'm not going to stay here. And then he got to our house and said, OK, I do want to stay here. Wow. And so we drove wow. all the way back two hours, got his one book bag, and then he came to mm. live with us for a wow. short time, um, finished his mm. schooling, graduated high school, glory to God. He yeah, is amen. an immigrant, and this year we, we adopted him uh, two years ago now, and then just nice. last month he became a citizen of the United States. Um, Come so, on, that's amazing. Yeah, it's wow. been so cool. And while, so while he was living with us, I birthed um, our second biological child, our okay. two-year-old daughter. Okay. Um, and yeah, we've fostered here and there. We've taken in biological parents whose children are in foster care. Mm. Um, and mm. now that sister that I was separated from lives with me full time. I was time. wondering about her. Yeah, she lives no with way. me full time. Yes. Oh, I love that. I, I, w I was wondering about her if the Lord ever like brought you full circle back into each other's lives. So that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, Tori, I'm thinking of our listeners who have pain and trauma from their own experience in the foster system or, or for just some other trauma in childhood. Mm -hmm. um, your story is obviously so inspiring, You, but you had to have walked through a lot of healing from some of those days of darkness. Can you just sort of 
um, encourage our our hurting listeners with a word about, you know, where do they go for healing? How do they begin their healing journey? Like, we know the answer is God, but like, what are some maybe even practical steps that they could begin to take to address their own pain from their childhood, especially if they were in the foster system or adopted and it was painful? Hey, friend, hope you're enjoying the podcast and these incredible stories of people who are walking through difficult challenges and traumas and finding hope on the other side of them. As many of our guests have shared, healing is a journey, and I want to take a moment to let you know about an incredible tool we offer here at Nothing Is Wasted Ministries to help you on your healing journey. Our Pain to Purpose course is truly the heart of what we do. It's a practical, life-changing, proven path to help you move from whatever trauma, tragedy, or trial you have faced in, in your life into a life of healing and purpose. But I don't want you to just take my word for it. Listen to what Michelle, a Pain to Purpose participant, shared about her experience with the course. I lost my daughter in November of 2018. She was married and had two young children, and it was just a terrible accident. I was definitely struggling with all the whys. The most beneficial part I found was the whole course, but um, that I needed to lean into my pain. I needed to process my pain, acknowledge it, because you had to feel it to go to process um, and come out on the other side. If you're ready to lean into your pain and come out on the other side like Michelle, I want to invite you to sign up now for the Pain to Purpose course by going to course.nothingiswasted.com. Again, that's course.nothingiswasted.com, or if you're watching on YouTube, Click the link right below. There you'll get access to all the course videos and everything you need to start moving from pain to purpose. Listen, pain, is an, it's inevitable. But you don't have to walk through it without the tools that can bring deeper healing. Let us guide you through whatever you're facing currently. Go to course.nothingiswasted.com. Well, I think there's so much healing in just knowing that we're not going to be fully healed until we're eyes to eyes with Christ in heaven. Mm. So I think yeah. so often we're going through life and we're like, I haven't made it there yet. I'm not mm. healed. I'm so broken. Yeah. And that's just like the enemy's bondage because he wants to totally. keep us like, totally. instead of looking at the work that you have left to do, look at how far God has brought you. There's just so much healing. And mm. again, that I, I say it all the time, look back, look back at where God has brought you out of not the place where you constantly feel like you have to go because you're not, we're not, I'm not going to reach it. You're not going to reach it. We're all not going to reach it until we are in heaven. And so there's just so much freedom in, in understanding that like perfection, full healing is not the goal here. Of course, holiness and goodness and being professional lovers of people like good and holy is, but like just that full, perfect healing that I think in our society we think we can aim for because we have therapy and we have all the resources yeah. around the, this trauma. Um, I think sometimes that bogs us ta- down, like having too much resources. Mm. So just wow. encourage you that like, you don't have to be um, mm. in an unrealistic place. Look at where mm. God has brought you. And then I want to just want to encourage so everybody good. to be in community. Uh, I think especially trauma survivors. And I don't mean this as like, Uh, This is going to hurt some people's feelings. That's not my intention. My intention is just to really, sometimes as trauma survivors, people can be soft on us. Um, And Mm. so I say this not to hurt you, but to just speak truth in life that as trauma survivors, as people who are unhealed, we tend to be easily offended because when you are unhealed, you are, can be offended by anything and everything. Wow. And that I think creates a great barrier for us to be in community and to be loved by people because we're so often offended and hurt by people and we get angry easily, you know, that's, yeah. And so, um, assume the best of people, hold a short record of wrongs. And I would say, find a community like community has healed me community has helped Mm. me so much and it is staying in that community and being faithful and loving that community not when they're abusive i'm not saying stay in abusive relationships 
But yeah. when there is tension and when there is hurt, being able to talk through it and work through it and understand one another and then see those people still stick by you in the midst of conflict, like yeah. that is how we heal. Because what that does is it contradicts yeah. our trauma because so much of our trauma says people leave. I can't trust yeah. people. I'm not loved. And then when we work through this conflict with our community and with people who love us, it says I can trust people. I am loved and people do mm. stay. Wow. Wow, Tori. That's so, so powerful. I, I, I really appreciate your kind of call to, to the community, too, because I do think so much of our emphasis, especially in our culture, is like on individual healing and to see that, yes, that is important, but that that happens in community, especially if community is the thing that wounded you. Perhaps the very place, a healthy Christ honoring community is where you can go for healing and find healing and stay there. That's such a good word stay there because so many people are just like jumping from community to community and oh i love that tori mm -hmm. thanks for that um i want to talk to you about the foster care system and uh changes you would like to see and how the church can be a part of it now most of our listeners are christians not everyone is but i'm a pastor and i am deeply passionate about churches being for justice and making changes in their neighborhood. And so this might be for me, if nobody else, Tori, but I, I really, I want to know your heart about reform in the foster care system and how the church can begin to be better advocates and allies. Yeah, well, the church has to be the foundation of the foster care system. We really have to mm -hmm. um, understand what scripture says. So in James 1, uh, 27, that's the scripture that says um, pure and flawless religion is to care for the orphan and the widow. And then James 1 ends. So it's like, okay, for real, there's no instruction around this. But <laughs> if we actually, when we read scripture, we don't have to read it uh, with the big numbers and with the way that it's divided up because that was put in by the modern man, not by the original authors. So let's just take that break out. Keep reading. What James continues to instruct us on is to not choose favoritism. So when a poor man yeah. comes to our home, to not put him at our feet, but to put him in the same place that we would put the rich man. So if you think about it, like what, what is that calling us to? It's calling us to mm -hmm. welcome uh, the poor, the less fortunate into our home yeah. and treat them the same as we would treat our church community, um, people who have more and put them in the same space in the same place it's literally it does give us instruction um and yeah. we have yeah. to ask god how do we obey that for everyone it's not mm. being a foster parent yeah. but i do believe that we can all put someone around our table and have a meal with them i do believe mm. that we can pick that person who's always walking off of the side of the road and give them a ride somewhere yeah um i do believe that we can go to the leadership of our church and say, hey, who are the foster parents in this, in our church? And if, if the leadership of your church says, I don't know, well, great, you have started a ministry all of a sudden, and yeah. now you can go find wow. them. And what you do is you wow. go find them and you find people in the church that are going to deliver a meal to them every month. 50% mm. of foster parents quit within the first year of them becoming foster parents because they don't have support because being a foster parent wow. is hard hard you think about yeah. you know when someone has a biological baby what happens there's baby showers uh people yeah. create meal trains for them yeah. people come and clean people came and cleaned my house when i had my second mm. born and when we yeah. had foster children no one gave, we had not one person wow. come and deliver That's a meal right. and it's just wow. and it's not ill-intended it's sure. because yeah. people don't think about it people don't know what to do but really, the thing is, let's create uh, people in a ministry that are going to do the same thing for foster and adopted youth, uh, offer mm. the family support that we would biological children so that foster parents are able to feel supported and, and stay in it. And okay, I'll say, I'll say so one good. last thing. Yeah, keep going. Something, <laughs> I think, you know, these are all like real tangible things. Something yeah. that we, and of course, you know, donate to good organizations. Like mm -hmm. if you're like, I can't do anything like boots on the ground. Like I really can't uh, because again, to do that, it is a great privilege. So like yeah. you can donate, but uh, uh, something that we can all do is youth in foster care and the foster care system. We see it so often as this broken thing. We see the kids in it as troubled mm -hmm. children. 
But God sees them as his children. You know, God Amen. sees all of us as his children. And so if we just say, God, break my heart for what breaks yours and help me see this system and these youth as you see them, then we're going yeah. to, we're, it's just going to naturally result in us engaging in the foster care system differently. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so good, Tori. Thank you for that. So, so good. Um, okay. I, I want to go back to your own healing journey and you obviously share your story so openly and all over the place and have since you were young. And so you've been doing this a long time. Do you feel like talking, sharing your story has been part of the way God has brought healing and redemption to you Absolutely. as well as Absolutely. Yeah. Just as yeah. I started this, like we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And I think that is so underrated. Like it just, we don't quite understand like, what that means sharing my story yeah. what it has allowed me to do it's allowed me to look back see god's faithfulness over and over and over and over again so now when something happens in my life i can just be like god has always been faithful to me like god mm. has brought me from wow. point a to point b to point c and so right now i can trust him in this moment and that doesn't mean i'm perfect at it but right. it does mean that actually i would say more times than not that I can be like, Lord, like this is okay. And like, I can rest in him rather than living in anxiety, um, which mm. is like, which is so, such a struggle of people coming from really hard places, backgrounds of trauma, right? If you have mm. complex post-traumatic stress disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, a direct result of that is anxiety. Um, and so when yeah. you can look back and say, God, I'm putting my trust in you, actively it just like doesn't eliminate the anxiety but it definitely decreases it and mm -hmm. i think telling my story in foster homes the first time i reported abuse i was called a liar reported abuse Oof. uh later in my 11th foster home mm -hmm. girl aubrey let's talk about this this is crazy i'm just i've never shared this on a podcast because it literally just happened but this is so crazy reported abuse in my 11th foster home okay just like a month or two ago, my foster dad messaged me on Facebook. He reached out to me and he apologized. No way. And I was called a liar by my caseworkers. And he said, he was like, actually, all that did happen. And I'm really sorry. <gasps> Are you kidding me? Talk not kidding you about that like how did you respond i mean what um, in the so world <laughs> when that's you kind of a heavy thing to bring to you because you're like well that would have been helpful a decade ago like tell me your keep going so when he first messaged me he was like hey kiddo so glad to see you on here like been thinking about you and i was like oh no <laughs> Yeah, I messaged there. I messaged him back and I just said, I'm really surprised that you added me on here. And I said, yeah, I'll never forget the tweet you tweeted when I left. What did um, it say? It said that was the easiest goodbye I've ever had to oh, make. Oh, Tori. Yeah. Um, it really hurt. Like oh, it really stung. Oh, 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 and to do it so publicly. Oh. Yeah. Um, and it was actually someone else that came to me with the tweet. So then, you know, everyone else in the community saw it. And I live in a very, grew up and I live that. in my small town now, grew up in this small town. Um, wow. Everyone knows the car you drive, everyone, like everyone knows everything. Everyone knows everything about you. Um, everyone mm -hmm. knows, everyone knows when I'm like going to travel, not everyone, but you know, like generally, like yeah, people know. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, as a young girl that actually cared about what I now I don't care what people think <laughs> yeah. as much yeah but as a 17 right. year old I sure did I did a of lot because did. everyone thought I was a bad kid and then mm. to read that tweet it did crush me mm. and I loved him he was actually I would say that he wasn't so much the villain in the um story as much as he was the enabler and okay. um I almost felt like even as a kid like I, I kind of knew he was a victim of it okay okay and wow. so I was really sad that that came from him. He, yeah, we've been talking and actually he said that he thinks he was like, I really don't remember that tweet. Like, and he thinks that it was his wife that tweeted it. 
And I, I actually would not, because she, she was the one that, you know, oh, I talk about it very openly in my book, but she was the one that did inflict all the abuse. And so, um, yeah, he, they divorced and that's why he came to me and said, like, I'm just so sorry. That's why he came to you. He was like, everything was true. He hadn't read my book either. That was a crazy thing. So he came to me, said all the stuff. Hadn't even read my book. Hadn't even known oh what pieces I put in my book. And, uh, and I, so all that to say, mm. telling my story throughout all the years before you get the validation that you're not a liar. And I could have never gotten that. But yeah. I get to share my story and people believe me. And Amen. God speaks mm. over me. Truth. Mm. Teller. Mm. Oh, it's so good. Because I, I, it's possible that I could have never gotten the validation that I didn't lie. And in yeah. the first foster home where my sister was abused, no one's ever came back and told me that, you know, yeah. I didn't lie. Yeah. And you may, that may never happen. And that will yeah. probably like, I, I mean, I would guess that it will never happen. Um, yeah. Yeah. But so now yes, you have t- agency as you're writing the book to be like, no, this is actually the truth. Oh, yeah. I just know. Like, I absolutely, like, I, I have a pretty good memory. And I don't. I just know, like, I'm like, I know that that happened. And I really believe uh, a majority of the time when kids say stuff like that, like, they just aren't making it up. Like kids are like making this stuff up in their head. So Mm. all Mm. that to say, yeah, storytelling has been so healing to me. And then, you know, I tell my story publicly. I, yeah, from the book, from social media, and I receive all these messages and uh, oh. I saw a post yesterday that made me kind of irked me. Uh, let me share it with you. It was from someone. They were like, I have like 400,000 followers and um, you I don't need to be. Post. Yeah, you don't need to be on here and go like do stuff in your community. And I yeah, was like, yeah. OK, well, uh, but there is good stuff that happens on here. And you can there do is. both. And- and, and that's where the people uh, are. I honestly thought the voice in it was kind of mean. Like I did too. I did. I uh, didn't totally. I didn't totally get what was happening. <laughs> it, so, it sounded so angry. Like I literally wanted to come on and be like, "Are you angry? Like, like are you okay? Is everything are you okay? okay?" But you. The point is both and. Like you're sharing your story, and God is using that through social media because yes. that's where people are. Yes. You're also living an embodied life in your community. You're not choosing. You're not like yes. doing it just to build platforms and I, celebrity. I, like I really believe that like social media is a second world. It's like the second it world, is, and we Tori, are meant yeah. to be in the world, but not mm-hmm. of it. And if yeah. we are not showing up there and shining the light of Christ, then it remains dark. Amen. And I don't think Amen. that's like our first priority or the only place sure. that we should be. But I do believe, especially yeah. the younger generation. Like I'm a Gen Z. I'm the oldest of Gen Zs, and I think Gen yeah. Zs and the generation like. Below us, yes, there's so much like security that needs to be put in place that I will put yeah. in, my, in place for my kids. But there's also a God yes. that prepares us for what is in our lives. That's right. And so, That's right. um, yeah, I, I honestly, I love social media. I love it so much. Yeah. I'm so grateful yeah. for the way that God has used it. And it has mm-hmm. brought healing to me because I get all yeah. of these messages. I've gotten messages from people mm. that say they have their daughters and sons have come to Christ after hearing my story. Aww, the, one of the first Tori, messages that I so ever good. got, I will never forget it. I spoke at my youth group when I was 17 years old. I had no idea what I was even saying. Like, mm. no idea. And they met someone messaged me about two years later. And this is one of the first messages I ever got. And they said, we started fostering our foster care journey that week that we heard your testimony. And today we are adopting our daughter because of what God has done through Stop your story. It. That Come was, on. and that was the first message I ever received. So it was like, oh, like, uh, yeah. and it was two years later, yeah. like you planted the seeds God reaped the harvest. Uh, but so yeah, there's so much power in storytelling and showing up mm-hmm. online and in our communities. Yeah, so good. So good. Um, Tori, I want to keep you for a few more minutes, if you'll let me, because there's a couple things you've said that I want to come back to. One, I'm just very struck by your boldness, even at a young age. Like, to re- one, to report abuse, I, I just is so courageous, especially at a young age. I mean, there's adults that have been through abuse and are still afraid to talk about it. 
and then your boldness even now just to continue to share your story and speak up for um, other people's stories and um, I don't know I just I just appreciate that God has given you that voice even when you are in the midst of some really really difficult things that you are like no this is not right I'm gonna stand and I know you just said you kind of questioned well with my sister, if I wouldn't have, with, we have been, not been separated. Like, of course, the enemy is going to get in there and try to make you question that boldness. But um, I just see that in you, and I am so grateful for it. And so I, I don't really know what the question is about that, but d- does that come naturally to you, I guess? Yeah. Maybe? Like, has that just been the way God's created you? To be honest, I think it's twofold. So I think a little bit of it is self-serving in a way because I think that I've always had a bit of survivor's guilt. I mm. That is like still the question that I have for God. Like, why do I get all of this? And I know like God's favor is real, but why doesn't yeah. God's favor cover? <laughs> I don't know, you know? Every, like, I know. Let's I know. just ask the question. I know we're all wondering right. it. Like, why right. doesn't God's favor cover all these foster youth after me? Like, yep. why don't they get to right. have a microphone and right. um, get to share God's truth and word and be encouraged by uh, communities? Yep. And yeah. so I think the way that we combat survivor's guilt is that we mm. try and change things for the survivors coming after us. Like, that's the only way to really overcome it and make sense of it. So, yeah, just being honest, I think a bit of it is self-serving. And then I think the other part of it is is that, like, a huge motivating factor for me has always been to love others. And I think that's because Mm. I, for so long, didn't feel loved. And I don't want any other person to feel that way. Like, I don't want people to feel the way that I felt, Mm. lonely and forgotten And so, like, I know that, like, justice is intertwined with love. And they're not two separate things. I think that sometimes people are like, God's justice, God's love. It's like, no, God's justice is (laughs) God's love. And God's love is is God's justice. And so, um, I I am a pretty justice-oriented person. Um, I'm also, I want to be a loving person. Uh, my, My whole heart, I always say, I want to be a professional lover of people. And so there was always this, this thing planted in me. I think that was like, I can't be silent and keep, you know, kids in, especially they were more vulnerable than me because when you don't have a voice, when you don't speak up, when you're not bold, you're just more vulnerable. Right. So I felt like I had to to say something. Um, it was just a part of what loving people Mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That actually kind of connects to the last question I want to ask you, Tori. And you, you've kind of said like when, especially when you were younger, these sort of names that people spoke over you or, or you spoke over yourself or the enemy did it. Liar, forgotten, unloved, I know a lot of our listeners um, live with those sort of scripts, right? Like kind of these false names that we speak over yeah. ourselves or somebody has spoken over us. Um, has been has it been a part of your healing journey? And I guess how has it been a part of your healing journey to sort of understand, no, this is who God says I am. I, I'm a truth teller. I'm not a liar. I am loved. I'm not unloved. God knows me. I'm not forgotten. Like, has that been a part of your journey? So... It has been, I think in different seasons, there are different things that kind of, um, I don't know, kind of like add balm to those wounds. I think Mm. that sometimes we can like treat God like he's a Band-Aid or just cover it up. Like, oh, I'm not a liar. I'm a truth teller. (laughs) It's all good now. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And that doesn't really work long term. We have to. there. So, again, I think there are different things. So there's my community that Mm -hmm. is my church. Another thing that I read the other day. um, Obviously, I'm on social media too much. People can judge me, whatever. But another (laughs) another thing I read on social media was the church is not a talent agency. And that, and ever, like, I'm just thinking about these things. I'm not angry about them. or I'm just like, hmm, okay, the church is a talent agency, but the best leaders will see in um, their congregation what they are good at and what they are called to and put those in, put 
them in those positions. So yeah, something like that my church did. Yeah, and activate them. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. like something that we've already talked about this was something that my church did at a very young age was they saw what God was doing in me long term. And I think there are some people, there are some ministers and some leaders that would say what my church did was very irresponsible, giving me a microphone at 17. Um, maybe it was, but God was good and gracious in our irresponsibility. Right. And through that, he showed me who I was called to be and what I was called right. to do. So I've right. always had, I've had my community not just speak things over me, but give me opportunity to actually show me, live it, who I am called to be. That has healed me actually, mm. like being able to not just, not just have it spoken over you, but when you are given opportunities where you wow. actually get to live out what wow. God has called you to, it's healing because what that does is it in your life, it literally, it does, you don't just hear it, like God is literally proving it to you through the work that you're doing, mm. through your vocation, yeah, through your obedience to him. Um, so that's yeah. been a, a huge, huge thing. Um, mm. Another thing I would say is like therapy is yeah. like just yep. doing the hard work of talking. And then when I talk being like, oh, like that's where that comes from. <laughs> that's where the lie that's is. That's where that Usually, lies. Usually yeah. like we don't get to, so like, the analogy that I like to say is like a tornado. And so that we actually have a tornado warning here today. Well, anyway, so <laughs> like it's like a tornado. That's how we've been in Chicago too. It's crazy, right? Yeah, now. it is crazy. But in a tornado, it's like a cent- tornado. The center of it is a vortex. It's called like the vortex. And what that vortex does is it sucks up everything good, flourishing businesses, um, churches mm-hmm. worshiping, families at home having dinner, right? It sucks up all these good things. And in our minds, like we have this storm as trauma survivors, we have the storm circling around in our minds. And I don't know if it ever goes away. I think it slows mm-hmm. down. Um, but what we can do to slow it down and to calm it, because Jesus gives us the power, just like he calmed the storm, we have the power within us to say, Jesus, you're going to calm the storm. But what we have to do is we have to go to the vortex and say, what is the lie that is sucking all the good things up? We have to identify what that vortex is. And so a lot of times, like therapy is just identifying, like, what is that vortex? What is that lie um, that is sucking things up in this season at this time? And it changes throughout season to season because like we aren't ever going to be fully healed until we're eyes to eyes with God in heaven. And so it's just continuing to um, Mm. engage in that work. And yeah, yeah, there's so many, so many different things I could say in in terms of healing. But I would say those are probably the two two main things. And then uh, the things that I, I tell myself like all the time when I kind of start to get worked up is that, you know, people can kick me out. People cannot want me. That's probably my big thing now, still to this day. Uh, and not like, obviously not being like kicked out of home or kicked out of family. Right, right. But I think I, that's where the root is. But now today it's like, oh, why wasn't I invited to that? Like, why wasn't I included? Mm. Why am I not wanted? Why don't people mm. think about me? Am I forgotten? Yeah. You know, that's kind of where my brain goes. And the thing that I speak over myself that can calm that. That's, and again, that's probably my most consistent lie. Um, yeah is that people cannot want me, you know, people can kick me out, people cannot text me back, but Mm. like God calls me his son and his daughter Mm. and people cannot want me in their space, but God has created a room for us in the kingdom of heaven and his opinion trumps any other opinion. And that's so healing because like, I'm worried about like Joe Schmo's opinion of me, but like literally <laughs> the God of the universe who created it all says, I have a room in a kingdom for you. Mm. What? Yeah. What else is there? Oh, Tori, it's so good. Oh, oh, I love that. I love that. Thank you for that. Thanks for being here with us today. It's so incredible to hear from you. Aubrey, this was so fun. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Eric, I I literally say this after every episode, but that was another powerful conversation. And I mean, oh yeah, you know, I she Tori's so inspiring. I think what's inspiring to me is that she's actually living this life of radical hospitality. Like the mm-hmm. fact that I think when at the time I was interviewing her, she they she and her husband had just adopted a teen who came to live with them in the foster care system. Yeah. So. Wow. This is nothing is wasted, right? Like 
yeah the pain that you've been through now god is using you in that same area to and this is scripture to bring comfort to other people this is I mean, yeah so powerful it, it just made me want to live a different yeah, way didn't listening it? to her story mm -hmm. i mean to listen to not only what she's endured and you'd think she's a young woman yeah. like you said yeah. you know you you think I've been through so much. I just want to rest now. Mm -hmm. And now she's caring for foster kids, adopting, and they go through the McDonald's drive through and invite the workers to their house for dinner. That's the part I was like, what? Uh, I'm like, yeah, wait, wait. Like, yeah, I'd, yeah, maybe I'd give them a tip or something. Right, but right. Like, no, definitely you're not coming to my house. I'm not inviting yeah. you to my house. <laughs> Yeah, really. That's really just impressive. crazy hospitality. Mm -hmm. And do you think wow. that that's a specific? Is that like an anointing or a spiritual gift, or is that just something like we all got to grow in? Well, and, I think it's probably and, both. Yeah. You know, like there are people like all the spiritual gifts that I see like are things we're all called to, mm. but it seems like it's an extra gifting at the time yeah. or a special extra vocational calling in their life yeah. but i i don't think everybody's called to invite the right. drive through worker to your house right. um but we should all probably be thinking as i go through drive throughs or checkout yeah. lines or whatever yeah. i do am i thinking about this other person as a person yeah that i'm called to serve yeah. here and now yeah that's good that's really good one of the questions that Tori talks about asking when she was in the foster care system, and I mean, her story was really quite painful. If God is good, why did I experience so much pain? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I would say that is that ends up being the question, the theodicy question, right? What, if God is good, why is there evil in the world? If God is good, why am I suffering? Why did my best friend suffer? Why did my kids suffer, right? I feel like that is sort of the question when it comes to pain and suffering, it how can both be true? How can God be good and and pain exist? There's a French theologian yeah. named Henri Blochet who talks about like there that's one of the kind of the foundational aspects of the Christian faith is that we believe God is good and evil is evil. And yeah. we have to somehow hold them at the same time, knowing that God will one day conquer evil in full and has begun that work on the cross. But the reality of both existing, God can be good while there's this horrible stuff in the world. It's a hard, it's hard to reconcile with that yeah. logically, right? Yeah. And I think, I don't know if it was this interview or another one I was listening to. I get them all mixed up. But yeah. so I just heard someone saying that, like that question of what are we going to, believe about God in the face of evil and suffering mm -hmm. is like the central question of Christianity. Yeah. Yep. And we all, we all have to wrestle with yep. it. And Tori's story is just an amazing, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, you know, I don't, I don't think we should ever compare our suffering to each other, Yeah. but I get tempted in, in right, stories like right. this where I, I, you know, I, I was raised in a home where my parents got divorced when I was young. And mm. so I've seen and experienced painful things, yeah. but I wasn't raised in an abusive home. Yeah. And, you know, like when I hear Tori share about getting beat and being like, it finally was enough and right. I hit back and then right. I got charges pressed against me and, you know, we had to go to court and, and just listening to even the betrayal mm -hmm. from like, she shared about that foster uh. parent tweeting or putting on Facebook like that's the easiest goodbye I've ever that had was after the, she that was so, oh, so brutal so brutal. brutal and and I think about someone who's been through stuff like that and them coming to trust Christ yeah and you're like uh, I the hurdle they have to come over to believe in God yeah. like okay God loves me yeah. and he's all powerful and this has been my life yeah that's that's just it it reminds me that the power of God for salvation is the gospel mm, mm, not us not us yeah because we we couldn't convince Tori mm -mm. to put her hope in Christ no not after that and so it it should embolden us yeah. to love the McDonald's drive-thru yeah, person yeah that's right it should and and to right 
and to watch God move, not try to control yeah. the outcome of it. Yeah, that's good. That's yeah. a really good word. I was thinking about, we interviewed Tim Challies a few weeks ago, mm. and he talked about his own loss of his uh, son, which is a different story, except mm-hmm. I remember one of the things he talked about was how sometimes God goes, here's this really painful, awful thing, and I'm going to ask you to steward it, almost like it's a gift. And that's a hard that's a hard concept I think to even wrestle with and and sort of try to make sense of but thinking about that in light of Tori's story I feel like this is a woman who is stewarding her pain so well oh. right as God yeah. has like God has of course ministered to her and brought healing to her life and the story of her coach and like just oh. amazing things God has done and now in that radical hospitality I think that's her hospitality I think that's her stewarding the pain and the suffering that she went through which is a hard thing to ask of someone in pain like will you steward yeah. this mm-hmm. and yet I I I think that's I, that's the call right yeah, it, I, th- I think it is. I mean, even I, and we don't want to shame people. That's it. Who, yeah, that's good. You know, like we're, we're not saying you got to be like Tori, mm-hmm. but, you know, I think of Jesus on the cross as he's hanging there, he's suffering, he's dying, he's in unimaginable agony, and he sees his mom mm. and is like, oh, she's watching her firstborn son die. Now she needs someone to take care of her. Yeah. So I'm going to give her John oh. and I'm, uh, and in the middle of his suffering, mm. he is yeah. still caring mm-hmm. for other people. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I think that's the, that's the word of hope I'd want to give to someone who's listening and going, I can't, I can't do what Tori's doing. And we're never called to try to be the same yeah. identical to somebody else, yeah. but we can look at Christ and we can go, he knows what it's like mm. to be in agony mm. and to serve other people. Mm. He succeeded where you failed. So mm. God's not looking at you in that moment on your record, but on the perfect righteousness of Christ. Amen. And since Jesus has been there, he knows what it's like and he knows how to help you. And he's willing to help you do that. And so don't grow discouraged and give up. Uh, run That's to Christ so and go, Jesus, help me know how to serve you in my own pain. Mm. Oh, such a good, such a good thought, Eric. I, I love that. You know what's interesting about that? The story of Jesus on the cross saying to John and Mary, like, look, there's your there's your son, there's your mother. I, for some reason, I always read that as harsh a little bit. Like, I'm not sure why, but I had a very strange, mm. very strange reading of it. I don't know if I had heard it preached that way or just the way I was interpreting it. And and so to hear, I remember just even recently, like it might have even been on Good Friday at a service hearing like, no, that's Jesus in his pain and suffering, caring for them, putting them together as family. I was like, that's what Jesus does in our pain. So that's a good word, Eric. Like it, yeah. remember if you're suffering that we can look to the perfect suffering of Jesus and the perfect ministry of Jesus and invite him to be the person who like leads through us when we yeah. feel like we don't have the strength to do such it. Such a such a beautiful scene. Mm, so good. Well, we we love encouraging you. That's part of what we do here, especially in your pain. It's our passion to partner with you, to partner with God, to take back your story, especially when the enemy has tried to rob you of so much in your grief and your heartache and your own growing up experiences. And so we would love to invite you to go to our website, nothingiswasted.com slash community. And there we have our community platform our Community Plus platform. Community Plus is a subscription. It's $20 a month. It's actually tax deductible. We have extra resources for our Community Plus members, courses that you can't find any place else, original content you can't find any place else. So again, we'd love to invite you to go to nothingiswasted.com slash community. We also want to thank Sleeping at Last for providing the music for the Nothing is Wasted podcast. You can find, stream his music wherever it is you do that. You can follow us at Instagram, uh, on Instagram at Nothing Is Wasted Ministries, at Obsamp and at EM Shoemaker, spelled Schumacher. We'd also love to invite you to review, like, and subscribe to the podcast at Apple Podcasts and on YouTube. By doing so, you help others find this incredible story and other incredible stories of pain to purpose. 
Eric, you want to tell people about our next guest? Because this is a good one next week. Oh, yeah. Next week, Davey interviews Randy Alcorn. Randy Alcorn. I feel like he's like a uh, he's like an icon. He is an icon. Like, I've been reading Randy Alcorn for, like, ever. This is you know, awesome. Fiction, nonfiction. Mm-hmm. Like, he tackles so many different subjects. And I... I f- I feel like everybody loves Randy. Everybody like, loves Randy. <laughs> like, like, I don't know why you wouldn't love Randy. Yeah, well, that's and, good. That's good. And just the the conversation between Davey and Randy about losing a wife. Mm. You know, Randy's wife recently died. Mm. And um, that's it's just a sweet, a sweet fellowship yeah. to be able to get the privilege of looking in on it. And... Yeah, on the two of them kind of sharing that together. Yeah, what a beautiful thing. Well, with that in mind, let's go ahead and take a listen to part of Davey's conversation with Randy Elkhorn. You know, as you as you were researching for heaven, as you've experienced some of your own suffering, as you've watched, as you watched Nancy and you were by her side, why is a proper theology so imperative to um, us being able to walk through pain well? Wow. I mean, great question. It it is so essential because it's the lens through which you see everything. It's the lens through which you see God. It's the lens through which you see life. It's the lens through which you see other people. Um, And when I say it's the lens through which you see God, it's if you actually have a wrong worldview, an unbiblical worldview, worldview like we were talking about, health and wealth theology, prosperity theology, then what's going to happen is you're going to believe when suffering comes, God is letting you down. Or maybe God isn't even there. Maybe he isn't real. I'll never forget years ago when I was writing my book, If God is Good, a problem, uh, a book on the problem of evil and suffering. And of course, I solved that problem uh, easily in that book. No, but I've, I'm I've written, glad, I'm glad you I've written several books on uh, that and of course did not solve yeah. it. But it's the yeah. question of the ages. But here's the thing. Um, uh, the people of God have always known about the problem of evil and suffering. and right. uh, But people today, Christians today, and many evangelical churches don't think about the problem of evil and suffering right. until it happens to them, and then they don't have answers because they have yeah. the, their God is so small that he's like a genie uh, mm. that when they pray, it's like Aladdin's lamp, and yeah. he appears and he does whatever they want. And so they're, they're telling God, they're claiming this, and God must do that. And Nancy and I were so uh, aware. Our worldview was, okay, Better people than us, by far, in the case of Jesus, infinitely better, have had their prayers not answered. I mean, right. Jesus' prayer in the garden right. was that wow. the Father would remove this cup of suffering from him. He added yeah. the caveat, you know, your yeah. will be done. If it's your will or your will be done. But the the main prayer itself was deliver me from the suffering. Now, Are you and I profoundly faithful that God did not answer that prayer? Absolutely. Hey friend, if you liked this episode, be sure to like and subscribe so that you can stay in the loop every time Nothing Is Wasted releases a piece of content here on this YouTube channel.